caution, extreme subject matter leading to cursing and blasphemy. So if you've been following my YouTube channel for a little while, you'll know that most of my content is long COVID related. And one of the most important things in long COVID is pacing and keeping your heart rate down and keeping down the level of sympathetic nervous system activation. So pretty much the last thing you should ever do would be to come to what is probably the most demanding, challenging, terrifying, notorious racetrack in the whole world and take around an antiquated stainless steel contraption. So what is it about the Nürburgring that's quite so terrifying? Me. Me. Well, the answer is it's about five times longer than an ordinary racetrack. It's 21 kilometers long. It's got 130 corners, which are between them either blind or off camber, and there's surface changes and there's no runoff, which basically means if you get it wrong, you're in the barrier. It's in fact so terrifying that it was named the Green Hell by Jackie Stewart, the Formula One driver, and that was shortly before it got dropped from the Formula One calendar in the mid-70s for simply being too dangerous. And believe it or not, Jensen Button, the Formula One driver, said the one thing that he'd never do would be a tourist farting day at the Nürburgring. A tourist farting is basically anybody can turn up here and go round. And he said, it's simply too terrifying. And this was from somebody who's won, you know, world titles in Formula One. One of the other incredibly gnarly things about the ring is the traffic. Fucking hell, mate. Because literally anybody can go out there at the same time. So you're out there with super bikes and GT spec race cars and local heroes. Where they all come from? The thought coming at the end of the day, it'll be quiet. And they're coming past you uh, incredible speeds and you've got to be looking in your mirrors as much as you're looking forwards. However, one of the advantages is that I'm going to be going so slowly relative to them that I'm going to be losing time by pulling over to let them pass. Christ on a bike! Rather than getting stuck behind slow coaches because I'm going to be the slow coach. So <laughs> what am I concerned about whilst taking a DeLorean round here? Uh, the answer is quite a lot. Firstly, the brakes um, and stability under braking uh, is not its forte. Also brake power and then also just boiling the brakes. I'm pretty worried that I'm going to get a spongy pedal after about four corners and I'm going to be a world, <laughs> a world of pain for the rest of the lap. Uh, what else am I concerned about? Body control. The DeLorean's handling at the time was deemed to be a little bit wayward at high speeds and its on-the-limit behaviour was unpredictable. Oh shit me! It's now obviously 41 years old, that was what people were saying 41 years ago. And my car has now had 41 years to fall apart and it's been put back together by me. The other thing that I'm particularly worried about is reliability. Uh, when I hit the carousel, is the car even going to stay in one piece? Oh. So a couple of things to say for those expecting to see an eight-minute bridge to gantry lap. Um, first of all, this is a tourist farton session, so there is no lap timing allowed. And secondly, uh, there's probably three things uh, that you need if you're going to try and drive that quick round here. And the first of all is uh, a half-decent modern car. Secondly, a pretty massive steely set of balls. And thirdly, a bunch of laps under your belt. And <laughs> to be quite honest, I have got none of those. Um, certainly not in the 14 years since I was last here anyway. Um, so we're not going to be setting any records, but that's not really the point. Uh, the point of this is to see how well a 41-year-old car that was derided by critics at the time can cope uh, when thrown at the most demanding racetrack in the world with a little bit of gusto. Okay, so this is the Nürburgring and what you haven't seen is the fact that I just spent about four hours with the car misfiring horrifically and cutting out and basically having horrendous breakdowns um, and it in the end was just a loose cable onto the ignition distributor. Are we going to have a problemless something amount of time here let's uh let's hope so helps if i can actually it's okay okay so one of the problems i'm gonna have uh as we go around is the amount of traffic there's been a stoppage um and the amount of M2s, M3s, GTRs, 911 GT3s out there on the track right now, uh, out there on the road waiting to come on is gnarly. And the issue I've got is that 
clients um, is that they're priority, not me. Um, and what that means <laughs> is that the line around the, uh, the track is not mine to take. If there's a car behind me, I have to indicate and pull over. Vauxhall Corsa behind me, who I am actually leaving behind. Praise be the Lord. Okay, coming up to about uh, 95 miles an hour into Tiergarten. Uh, very fast couple of corners here. Um, I ought to point out that uh, I'm not going for a lap record around here. Um, you're not supposed to on tourist Martin days anyway. And this track is so demanding when you've got 80% of your corners being blind, that you can't hit the wall at 10 tenths. Because if you do, you're gonna have a massive whoopsie unless you know exactly what you're doing. You've done a thousand, um, a thousand laps, which I have not done. Um, I'm gonna go at about seven tenths um, and try and give you a little bit of a running commentary about what it's like to do this in the DeLorean. I've got a very fast car behind me going to pull over and let him through. He's doing a bit of braking. Off he goes. Yeah, look at him. He's scrubbing off through there. This was this is Hudson back down here. Another very fast section. I'm not sure how long my brakes are going to last. I guess maybe about half a lap if I'm lucky before the brake fluid gets too hot and I lose the compressive ability and I have to give myself about twice as much time <laughs> under braking. Um, as I would normally do. Right. Oh, the car's making a few little rattling noises, but so far it's actually handling pretty well. Um, oh, it's quite gnarly this section as we come down into Quiddlebatch. Very fast down here, if you're, especially if you're in a fast car. Um, at the bottom of Quiddlebatch here, we go up into Foxhole. Uh, uh, Flugplatz, not Foxhole, Flugplatz. But over this lip right here, Formula One cars used to take off back in the day. I'm doing 100 miles an hour. I'm going to brake early because this is a DeLorean, not a Formula One car, and I don't want to get air. Um, and we come around this section into Schroedenkreutz, which is the fastest section of the track. I'm going to pull over because I've got a Lotus Exige approaching very quickly. Hopefully he can get past without me having to slow down too much. Came for and lifting. Oh god, it's hairy if not taking your own line around here. But Schroeder Kreutz, 110 miles an hour here. Oh, and here comes the traffic now. Um, I'm going to indicate, I'm going to let them all past. I've got about a fuck ton of much quicker cars all coming through. I'm just going to not mess about. Coming to Arenberg now. All of these guys, I do not want them up my chuff. Okay, am I still indicating? No, good. Okay, late apex on this one, so not that it makes any difference because I started off on the right hand side of the track. And now we come down into Foxhole, another very fast section of track down here. Um, about 120 miles an hour. And it is sketch as you like. This corner is major G's. I'm braking a little bit, you shouldn't really have to, but I'm basically a bit of a pussy. Fuck me. I did not enjoy that. I don't enjoy him coming past me with about a nanometer away from me. This is at an hour forced we're coming into here. The internet ninjas would tell you that you need to, oh god I'm just going to indicate, this is a bit gnarly. Yeah I don't, I just don't want to get into a mess where these guys are sorry for getting a bit quiet there, I'm just dealing with an army of angry, fast cars um, trying to overtake me. Here we go. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know what this corner is up here. I'm gonna give it the brakes quite early. God, those guys are absolutely barreling into it. I don't fancy that so much, but you can carry a lot of speed around here. Give yourself a bit more braking for this next left. Okay, I'm gonna indicate again. I'm not gonna take the apex. I'm spending half my time on the uh, on the mirrors here because it's a busy track. Right, late apex. All of these downhill right-handers down here. Late apex. Okay, my 
brakes start to fade. Predictable. It's quite a tricky section of track down here. These corners do not take many prisoners. Okay, I've got a guy, he's telling me to pull over by indicating left himself. I'm just gonna back off, let the layout pass, let the Porsche pass, get some braking done. Get to second gear. It's another late apex here. That Porsche took a very nice line through. I did not. Okay, we've now got a bunch more guys who are much quicker than me. Off you go, son. Off you go. And I've got a bunch more. So if we're coming out to Adenau Bridge here, I'm just gonna let all of these guys have at it. There's, they just don't stop coming. This is an absolute party for the maniacs. Right. Up the hill we go. And I've got the Corsa behind me. He's caught me back up again. Right, so it's me versus the Corsa. Have I got the legs on him up the hill? Almost halfway around the lap now. Um, in terms of time. I don't know what time it is, but it's about halfway. Coming into Berg work here. This is a famous corner. Uh, back in the 1970s, uh, Formula One cars had a bit of trouble with this. It used to be the odd off or two. It's probably a bit smoother these days than it was back then. And now we've got a really long drag up the hill and fast BMWs are going to go straight past me on the inside here. I'll just indicate, let him know I'm not going to take this apex. There you go, mate. All yours. Have at chi. I'm going to leave it in third up this hill. Car does not sound particularly happy about it, but I'm going to lift off a bit for this left. There we go. Stay in third. There's a 300 metre altitude change at the Nürburgring. Um, basically, you climb an entire mountain and it feels like it's up this section. It really feels like it. This corner can't quite see what's around it. Don't remember the track well enough. Okay, I'm gonna get to third for this little puppy. Round we go. Long old climb. That, uh, oh no, we've got a Suzuki Swift coming up our arse now. Modern Super Mini's doing a better job of the Nürburgring than a 41-year-old DeLorean. But that is fine. I'll get, oh, okay. All right, mate, he's flashing me. I mean, fair enough, all right, off you go. It's a Citroen C2. See, this is the amazing thing about the Nürburgring, is little guys in stripped out cars who know the track with slick tires can go around at an incredible rate of knots. Coming up to the carousel now. Uh, BMW's going around the outside. I'm gonna take the inside. What I don't wanna do is bounce out of the carousel into him. That was quite a lively experience. I've now got another M3 behind us. Does he look like he wants to come past? Not really. Back time. Okay, I'm gonna let him past here. Okay, I've just got no chance here with these guys. There's um yeah, I can't I don't have the power to get past this um this BMW and there's so much traffic behind me I can't afford to pull out and try and get past him, which will take me half an hour because I'll just block off all the Razmasters. This is Hoei Act, the highest part of the course. I'm still indicating right. I'll let this M3 pass. Um, and now we're coming out to Whipperman, which is a series of um, corners with, of increasing, increasing, decreasing radius. Oh, fuck me. Sorry, excuse the language. See you later. Um, yeah, this, um, this BMW in front of us doesn't appear to know the rules of the ring. Um, he's all over the track. He's drifting left. Uh, he's not really looking in his mirrors very much. Um, so yeah, Whipperman or Seesaw in English. This is the left-hander down into Brunchen 1. It's uh, it tightens on you. It's a little bit gnarly. Brunchen 1 here. Oh, this guy. 
God, that was a bit hairy. Um, having a bit of a problem here. Oh, this is brunch and two. It's a big spectator spot. Uh, I've got that Corsa behind me again now. Let's see if we can actually get past this uh, BMW. Oh God, okay, okay. Get out of the way. Okay, I don't have the power to do it. He's all over the shop. got to back off otherwise I've got no chance. Okay I've gone very quiet down there because I was dealing with cars in a 360 degree sphere of influence. Uh, this is uh, we're into the Fansgarten section of track down here uh, and this is actually quite fast. I'm going to try and take him now. He was such a douchebag. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm getting quite hot behind the wheel here. The car has actually behaved pretty well, but one thing I have noticed is that I haven't had as much power as I would have liked. This is the mini carousel to do things like overtake that guy. You want to blitz past him in a flash, but it's really difficult if he's got his foot down and he's not lifting for you. And he doesn't realize he has to lift <laughs> when he's got a 41 year old car up his ass. He does need to lift. Um, okay, we're now coming into the final section of the track now. It's a fast right hander as we come into the gantry. I've already got more fast guys up my chaff just going to indicate and let them pass. There he goes. And another one. And this is where we uh, we back off and cool down. That is, this is the gantry. Um, and uh, yeah, this is where you get a chance to relax a little bit. <laughs> let the car cool down, let yourself cool down and uh, consider what you've just achieved, which is a lap of the Nürburgring, and that is not to be sniffed at. So let's go through some of my concerns uh, as they were before I went out there. And let's start with the brakes. I can't really say that the brakes were an overwhelming success around the Nürburgring. On the road, they have sufficient power and you can lock up the front wheels at 40 or 50 miles an hour. Of course, there's no ABS. But on a racetrack like the Nürburgring, you need more initial bite, which they don't have, um, and you need staying power. And the brakes faded after half a lap. And, four, and I did four laps around there in the end. Obviously, there's just one I showed you in the footage. Um, but, uh, but the brakes were basically gone from after halfway around the first lap and then remained gone for the whole rest of the, uh, for the, whole rest of the day, basically. Um, one thing that I was pleasantly surprised by uh, on the brakes was actually the stability. I was expecting a lot of squirreling uh, under braking and a lot of brake steer basically swerving around left and right coming into corners. And surprisingly, because whilst there's cambers you know, on the track, but they're relatively consistent across the track. It's not like a B road where you've got a crest in the middle of the road and then it falls away. That's the sort of conditions where sticking the brakes on hard will basically pull one of the wheels back more than the other and give you horrific brake steer. Surprisingly, I didn't get that round the ring. So that was one small positive. Let's talk a little bit about power. The car is, might be 40 years old but it's quick enough on the road this is the european spec version of the engine that puts out about 160 horsepower and as a result of that 0 to 60 is under eight seconds it'll do 135 miles an hour but compared to the other stuff that's whizzing around the ring not that you and i ought to just say not that you need huge power to be quick around the ring um but it did struggle on the straights and it did struggle especially going up the hill um, towards Hoa Act. The car really, really struggled up there and it basically just topped out at about 95 miles an hour and that was its lot. I think probably better to have left it in third gear and basically just tried to rev the pants off it all the way up there, but that just felt a little bit cruel given that it's about two kilometers long. 
as big a problem perhaps as the power uh, was actually the length of the gearing. So again, this has got a very long box on it, designed for meeting emissions requirements in the early 80s in California. Um, and that was one thing that was really, really noticeable. I'd have liked the whole box to be, the whole final drive to be like, I don't know, 30% shorter. Now let's talk a little bit about handling. And before I went and did the lap, I talked a little bit about how contemporary road testers thought that the DeLorean didn't handle as well as its peers, like the Porsche 928 or Porsche 911 or Ferrari 308, cars that it was competing against at the time for the American market. And I felt that the DeLorean was a little bit wayward. Um, now, I ought to point out that this car has had some modifications done. So all of those mods together probably have tightened up the handling considerably. And the car is still very soft by modern sports car standards. But what I was pleasantly surprised about was just how well balanced the car was around some of those corners, even at relatively high speeds. The massive rear weight bias on the car, 68% weight over the back and only 32 over the front, didn't make the car feel quite as sketchy as I was expecting it to. You know, when you basically get up towards the limit of grip and the tyres are squealing, the car felt surprisingly well balanced and I wasn't worried at any point about switching ends um, and understeer wasn't too horrific either. Now, having said that, I wasn't coming into corners super hot um, or at 10 tenths and that probably did help quite a lot if I'm being honest. But there is actually a, uh, an early road test of the car um, that was done by Car Magazine back in 1981 that talked about the handling of a DeLorean and actually the fact that it was set up to be a much more European handling car than an American handling car. And I think that really showed at the Nürburgring, actually, funnily enough. And certainly you have to remember here that 40 years ago, American cars were basically just boats on wheels. I think it's also worth talking a little bit about the experience of driving a DeLorean around the ring, uh, especially compared to a relatively modern car. And I think this is where classic cars, in their own way, sort of come into their own. And that is um, the, the physical, tactile, analog feedback that you get in a car where there are no computers between your right foot and what happens at the back wheels, or between your right foot and what happens at the front wheels when you brake, or between your hands and what happens between the steering wheels and the tires. All of this stuff is sort of mechanically, physically connected. And what that means is that when you start pushing the car, it starts talking back to you in ways that a lot of modern cars don't do quite as well, in my opinion. And there is something about that level of interaction that you get with a classic car that for me, is why I have one, to be honest. You know, I mean, yes, it's fun razzing something new and modern and quick around a racetrack, but I don't think it gives you quite that kind of old school hero <laughs> feeling inside that you get when you are manhandling as opposed to handling uh, something at high speeds or close to its limits, where it talks back to you as much as you talk to it in terms of telling it what you'd like it to do. So my concerns were that the car would soil itself <laughs> quite badly in numerous figurative or literal ways when trying to attempt the most demanding racetrack in the world. I think the car has actually come out of this acquitting itself surprisingly well. Um, and I think this goes to show that if you do a few subtle, sensible modern upgrades to this 40-year-old stainless steel contraption, it can still do some pretty remarkable things. So not my usual kind of content, but I hope you appreciated the slight change in scenery and content from what I normally deliver from my office. Now I'm off to go and do some rather regressive resting. Till next time.